so much for joining us tonight on BTV Major News at 6. Reaching you live from Benin City, the Edo State Capital, Nigeria. My name is Olua Tsui Oyedola. Let's quickly take a look at the highlights for tonight. Transparent elections under Bimas, he emerged from Edo Central. And then it's a major part of Edo Central. We are to protect critical national, state, and local government assets and infrastructure, securing them. The facility of the bank fall into that category because we are here to secure life and property. And whatever you want from any of the agencies. Transparent elections under Bimax. He emerged from Edo Central, and then he emerged from part of Edo South. We are to protect critical national, state, and local government assets and infrastructure, securing them. The facility of the bank fall into that category because we are here to secure life and property. And whatever you want from any of the agencies, you most likely to find it in one particular place. In the past 10 years, this has uh, become a recurrent decimal in our national life. The operatives of the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, Anambra State Command, on Monday embarked on a rigorous show of force, massive deployments, and area dominance in and around various flashpoints across the state. The state commandant of the NSCDC, Olatunde Maku said during the exercise that the objective is to protect the lives and property of residents. BTV News Best Orator completes the report. The NSCDC also stressed that the deployments were also to protect critical national assets across the state to strengthen the state's security in continuation of its anti sit at home confidence building patrol embarked upon by the command. Olatunde Maku added that the deployment and visible patrolling of personnel are aimed at ensuring that Anabra residents are adequately protected and secured to carry out their legitimate businesses on Mondays. And we have been supported by the state government to continue to carry out this anti sit at home order. During the first week, about three banks were open. By the fourth week, about 20 banks open. As of today now, we have about 25 banks. And that is the number in Oka within the metropolis. And we are still marching on. The Monday sit at home exercise was introduced in 2021 across the southeast region by the indigenous people of Biafra to protest against the rendition and continuous tension of its leader Manzin Namdi Kanu. No, although the proscribed IPOP group has said it has suspended the exercise, the people continue to observe it due to fear of attack by hoodlums who have used the exercise to unleash various attacks on businesses and properties, thereby forcing the people to comply. On Mondays, both commercial and economic activities are always at a standstill. We by markets, motor parks, petrol filling stations, schools, and other critical public enterprises remain short on the day. Commenting on the essence of the exercise, Marco said it is to build confidence for a seamless return to business on Mondays across the state and reassure the public that NSCDC, in synergy with other security agencies, have occupied the public space to send strong signals to misguided elements that it will not be business as usual because the command will deny them any opportunity to perpetrate crime in the state. We are to protect critical national state and local government asset and infrastructure securing them the facility of the bank fall into that category because we are here to secure life and property of india number and we are resolute in our determination in ensuring that is done to the fullest. He encouraged the people to go about their respective legitimate business as the operation will be sustained to revive the crumbled economic activities in the states and keep the unwanted miscreants of the states. Best Orator reporting for BTV News. The Delta State Police Command has rescued nine students who were abducted along the east-west road in Ugeli Delta State. The students were abducted on Monday according to Channels TV. Confirming the rescue, the state police public relations officer, 
Ed Daffy Bright, who wrote on his ex handle late one day that all nine of the victims have regained their freedom. The students were said to be traveling in a minibus before the abduction. The PRO said that the abductees may have been students who were returning from their school in Calabar, Cross River State, on Friday night. The bus driver was said to be unhurt, adding that the kidnappers hadn't demanded ransom while the police operatives had swung into action. Schools, especially in northern Nigeria, have in the last few years suffered attacks and abductions. of Christian Solidarity Worldwide is commending President Bola Tinubu, Kaduna State Government and security agencies over the safe rescue of the 137 school children abducted in Puriga village, Chikun local government area of Kaduna State. The group wants the same approach applied in rescuing others in captivity. The TV News Gift Uagboy has the details. Schools, especially in northern Nigeria, have in the last few years suffered attacks and abduction of students, lecturers, and other staff. The most recent is the abduction of 137 school children in Kuriga village, Chikun local government area of Kaduna State. 18 days after, the students were rescued by security operatives through the efforts of the federal and Kaduna state governments. The Christian Solidarity Worldwide Nigeria says the effort deserves commendation. However, CSWN also wants the same approach to be applied to rescue the 70 persons abducted in Gonin Gora community, Chukun local government, 61 in Buda, and 87 in Kajuru station, both in Kajuru local government of Kaduna state, and others in Bandit Den across the country. In the past 10 years, this has uh, become a recurrent decimal in our national life, where children who the only offense they've committed is that they wanted to be educated, go to school, and they are never reunited with their families. Uh, their return is, is very probable. So for these ones uh, to have returned, uh, you know, after spending such a short time in detention, we receive the story with a great welcome. And commend the effort of the law enforcement agencies, the government, uh, the government of Kaduna State and the <clears throat> the federal government, although this shouldn't have happened in the first place. Dr. Madu joins other Nigerians in condemning the recent killings of 17 soldiers who were on peace mission in Delta State and calls for thorough investigation. He appealed to the government at all levels to be more proactive in preventing attacks on schools, highways and communities. Gifts Uwagboy reporting for BTV News. The ongoing construction at the Edo Education Hub has recorded fast-paced growth. Upon visiting the construction site, the news crew observed significant appreciable progress. The report. The construction on the site for the proposed education hub has witnessed massive progress as the buildings have begun to take shape, signifying the level of work done so far by the contractor. In an interview with BTV News, the Commissioner of Information and Orientation, Mr. Chris Neikari, stated the education hub is one of the many already in place to develop the different sectors in the state. He noted that the construction taking place is on the mandate of the Governor Obataki led administration towards investing into Edo states, adding that the work would be completed before the end of the present administration. A lot of work is going on and uh, most of them are close to 75, 70, 80% completion. What we said when there was a flag of is that we will be ready before the end of this administration and we are keeping by those words. The contractors are doing a fantastic job. The buildings, the school, the health center, all the things that the education hub are coming on very well. And uh, the place is open. People come in every day to look at it. And I'm very happy that uh, you two have been there as uh, an organization to actually inspect to see what is going on there. It's the first of its kind in terms of uh, the education hub. We already have the Agri Hub, which is down Airport Road. We have the fiscal planning hub on, along Sapley Road. We have decentralized government, making government to reach the people. And whatever you want, 
from any of the agencies. You're most likely to find it in one particular place. The engineers overseeing the project commented on the fast-paced process of the construction work, revealing it has benefited them, not just financially, but has created an avenue to increase their expertise. While elaborating on the job opportunities, Edo residents would stand to gain. As per our schedule, we are scheduled to, to finish up by July ending. And the government project to house all the educational related offices and functions. That's why it's called Education Hub. I want nothing as good as you having good standard office to work with. So you're going to see state of the art offices and well equipped offices to work with. That will give you the comfort of working in a good office. Beside that, we have health center within this uh, site. It's going to serve the workers here and those in the immediate community. That's one great benefit. In addition to that, we have the cooperative halls and shop. You have a multi-purpose hall in that facility. You have some shop for commercial purposes. Also, that's another benefit, not only to those that will be working here, also to the immediate community too. They can use the multi-purpose hall for or whatever reasons or uh, functions they want to do. I've benefited from this project academically because I'm an IT student, you know, so I've actually gained a lot of experience from this project since it started. Um, I would say that since I came here and now, I've grown a lot, very, like, I've gone far, you know, academically, and I'm very proud of that, yeah. So, do you have any idea? Yes, actually, because when I came here, they've not created this building, and building K at the back, they have not gone anywhere, so they've gone very far. Well, as an engineer, every project is an avenue to learn more. It's an avenue to increase your uh, experience. So in time of experience, there are some challenges I have faced and we have been able to solve. So that is the achievement. We are here to solve problems and we have been solving it with speed and accuracy. On the phase we are on now, we are well over 75%. The Edo Education Hub, located at the former premises of the Ministry of Education, Iyaro Benin City, is scheduled for completion before the end of the Governor Obasaki-led administration. Oluwatsoi Oyedola reporting for BTV News. The managing and chief executive officer of one of Nigeria's leading clearing and forwarding company and CEO of Pinnacle Exotic Associate Limited, Mr. Paul Smith, CEO Egomba has thrown his weight behind the candidacy of Dr. Aswe Igodalo, governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the September 21st, 2024 election. Mr. Egomba stated this in an exclusive interview with BTV News Best Orator. I therefore declared and so remain Igodalo as the winner of just concluded primaries. Today, with a total vote of 577. Since his emergence as the candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the September 21, 2024 governorship election, Dr. Aswen Godalo has no doubt be receiving endorsement and support even before the doors for campaigns will be fully open according to INEC timetable. The latest person to throw his weight behind the candidacy of Dr. Aswe Godalo is the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Pinnacle Exotic Associates Limited, Mr. Paul Smith Ehombo. He said his stake is for someone who can provide governance as the preferred person to be the next governor that will succeed Governor Gordon Obaseki and that Aswe Godalo fits properly into the position because of his experience and he's someone with a large heart that is organic coupled with the fact that Igodalo Igodalo is a promised keeper. I, I say as well, Igodalo, the preferred candidate, and uh, is the one we are supporting to take over from Godwin Obasek. He's a man of experience, and he's a man with a good heart. He's organic, he's genuine. Whatever he's saying, he meant it. It's not like uh, every other position who will make promises, uh, uh, make promises and not doing it. But this man, Aswe um, Godalo, I see him like a man who is genuine, who really wants to take Edo people to the next uh, level. 
So it's not a politician. It's not a grassroots politician like every other politician who come and deceive the, everybody. And then the way they get there, no, you won't get what they promise you. But this man is he has not been playing pol politics, but he came in and see. And I want to take a do people to the right. Uh, Mr. Paul Smith, a humble said the PDP governorship candidate, Dr. Aswe Godalo, has genuine interest and concern for the people of Edo State, pointing to what he single handedly did for his people in Ewohimi, East and Southeast local government area of Edo State, where he hails from, as well as many other people. He said, as a businessman, he will put his business on hold to vigorously campaign for the victory of Aswe Godalo in the September 2024 governorship election. Very well, good to Ewohimi. He has done a lot for Ewohimi people. Where you come from. He has done a lot. A lot, a lot. I can't be measuring one, measuring them. He has done a lot. And the people of Ewo Himi can confirm that. And he loved them. So I believe when he become governor, he will spread, he will cut across that same experience that he has and what he has in mind to do for the people. Definitely he will do it. Me, as a businessman, I will put my business on hold to mobilize people. Not just to be with the team, but mobilize people and work for him and tell them uh, about us well, who we see him and what he's about to do for us. The two uh, people, the, uh, my message today is for them to come out in mass and vote for Aswan Igodalo. Despite the fact that campaigns have not started, Dr. Aswan Igodalo and his running mate, Osao Dio Ogi Esquire, are said to be already blazing the tray as support for them is gathering momentum. Best Orator reporting for BTV News. The senator representing Edo Central Senatorial District and gubernatorial candidates of the All Progressives Congress, APC, in the forthcoming September 21st election, distinguished Senator Mondi Ukwebulu, has presented his scorecard in office. He listed all his accomplishments at the Uromi Community Association Golden Jubilee celebrations and also gave a preview of what citizens, citizens rather should expect and when he's voted in as governor of Edo State. BTV News Best Orator has the rest of the story. The senator representing Edo Central, Senator District, and gubernatorial candidate of the All Progressive Congress, Senator Mondi Okwerolo, who was at the Golden Jubilee celebration of Uromi Community Association of Nigeria, was warmly received as he exchanged pleasantries with some of the dignitaries. In a remark, Senator Mondi Okwerolo recounted how the lack of basic amenities in his community as a child fueled his passion to provide portable water and infrastructural development for the people of Edo Central. <laughs> He further told the people laudable projects he has accomplished as the senator representing Edo Central Senatorial District at the 10th National Assembly, assuring the people that he will do much more if he is elected as the governor of Edo State. Senator Mondi Okwewelu, also known as Akpako Miza, promised the people that he will construct strategic roads in Edo Central, especially the one that will connect Esa land to other senatorial districts in the state if he is voted as governor. <laughs> Street 
APC governorship candidate thereafter made his way to the royal palace of Ewohimi in eastern southeast local government area federal state, where he paid a visit to the newly crowned Onoji of Ewohimi, His Royal Highness Lord Destiny Ebata Mehi Osifo Ogenen for the second. Highly elated. I am happy to be here at this time. As you all know, in uh, in this uh, in this part, in this time in those states, we are in a crucial period, and there is no better way to say it that I am happy to be here so that I can fight for my people. And as a man of my people's worries, my people's dilemma are what. Uh, what I fight for uh, in my foremost agenda. I might not be a politician. I might not be a politician, but I am in a position to make the life of every indigent of a woman better. And that is what uh, that is what I'm here for, and that is what I will do. Always the the king, our highness, long life. We pray for wisdom upon his life. I will pray for God's direction. God, it's only God that gives us wisdom. It's a young man, and we have a long way to go. We continue to pray for him. The newly crowned Onoji of Ewohimi, His Royal Highness, Lord Destiny, a Bata Miehi Osifo Ginen for the second stated that Edo State is in a crucial time and hence he will use his fatherly position to improve the lives of his people and alleviate their burdens. Senator Mondi Okwe will pray that God will give the Onoji the grace, wisdom, and strength to meet the expectations of the people. Best Orator reporting for BTV News. Former Labour Party frontline gubernatorial aspirant Dr. Dori Afe Efusao Koji has officially resigned from the Labour Party. This was made known in a letter addressed to the chairman of the Labour Party in Ward 4, East and Southeast local government area of Edo State. In the letter, Dr. Dori Afe Efusa Okoje stated that his resolve to resign from the Labour Party is sequel to his decision to quit active politics for the time being. This, he stated, will enable him to be entirely focused and dedicated to growing his private businesses. He also assured the party and those in the political arena of his continued support and enjoined them not to hesitate to contact him for his advice or counsel, especially concerning matters pertaining to moving Edo State forward. Dr. Dori Afe Efosa Okoje in the letter also thanked the various organs of the Labour Party for their support during his quest for the gubernatorial ticket of the party. He concluded by wishing the party well in all its future political engagements. It was an atmosphere of joy and celebration on Easter Sunday as Edo State Deputy Governor Right Honorable Comrade Philip Shaibu paid a visit to the Edo State PDP Chairman Honorable Tony Aziegbemi. Shaibu was accompanied on the visit by friends and political associates. BTV News Tosin Tulu Aloju has the details. <laughs> Dr. Tony Azigbemi was recently adopted by a known gunman in Benin City and endured 11 hours days in the hands of his captors. Shaibu was full of excitement while expressing joy on the safe return of Azigbemi. He noted that he had a personal bond with the family of Azigbemi because he is the godfather to Azigbemi's twin babies. The deputy governor used the occasion to wish well meaning Nigerians, particularly Edo Christian faithful, peaceful Easter celebration. He persisted that the Easter season could only be meaningful if Nigerians manifest the virtues of love, sacrifice and compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
that was the most good way to get to the car with blocks. Yes. 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 Block you. Yes. That way you were training you. I think they saw the car. Speaking, a highly elected Azibemi warmly welcomed Deputy Governor and his entourage to his Palatian Benin residence. He shared his experiences while in captivity, recounting the difficult moments he faced in the hands of our doctors. He emphasized that he would not wish anyone, even his worst enemies, to go through the ordeal he had in the kidnappers den, even as he recounted the trauma and fears he endured during his captivity. <laughs> To be turning back, safe and solid God is by your grace to God. Father, we have returned all the glory, all the honor, the adoration to you, Lord, for everything we teach back in some safe and sound with God. Father, we say thank you. Lord, we say thank you. Ancient of day, we say thank you. We have been unto you and you will know in that name. The visit by the state's number two citizen served as a symbol of solidarity, friendship, and gratitude for Zibemi's safe return to his family and friends, who were apprehensive of his safety after he was kidnapped. Tosi to Luwalojo, reporting for BETV News. Nigeria has witnessed a decline in its reading culture in recent times. This decline poses significant challenges to education, personal development, and national progress. What is more worrisome is that Nigerian youth see reading as a boring and unattractive exercise. The apathy of the younger generation to reading supports the popular saying which is, if you want to hide any information from a black man, put it in a book. BTV News set of Gaifum has details of this report. The advent of social media, smartphones and laptops is believed to have shifted the attention of the youth from reading books, thereby leading to a dwindling reading culture in Nigeria. Some of the persons interviewed lamented at the rate at which reading culture is gradually dying in Nigeria. They pleaded with the government to step in by equipping library with relevant books and organizing reading competition in order to imbibe reading culture among the youths. I've been a librarian, one of the challenges we are facing is readers' apathy in the library. And uh, we have uh, taken various steps to bring it to, to limelight. Uh, over the years, uh, the reading culture started to dwindle when the coming of social media, and the phones, the laptops, and all that. So a lot of people now focus, many students focus that they can just get their phone and start to do whatever they do. There's no need of going to the library. But the truth is that there's no way one can be able to read a textbook of about 2,000 pages or 500 pages online. But when in a book, you can even navigate to any chapter you want. The reading culture have actually affected the educational standard today we have. Most of our students can write a simple letter. They cannot even express themselves. So students not going there is reducing their value, their potentials, their inability to express themselves anywhere they go because of the lack of reading. And education will be revived again. Thank you very much. Our parents, we talk to our parents to train their children. Sometimes if they come back for, for school, Tell them about, uh, go to them, go to them, teach them for school, then bring the assignment, then let them know. If they play, small play, small reading, it's okay. So that is how definitely improve their children to, because in case we can grow up now, if we're going to really go to motivate them. A librarian who spoke with BTV News growed over the attitude of the younger generation as regards learning. He stated that it is disheartening 
to see Nigerian youths who cannot write letters or express themselves fluently. He added that the decline in reading culture needs to be addressed as it is reducing the value, potential and capacity of the youth. If you go to most of the schools, when you talk of infrastructure, it's like nothing. Uh, go to the libraries, there are no books. Even in the classroom, no good chairs. So if the environment is conducive enough for students, either tertiary, primary or whatever, they will be encouraged. You know, if the society can change, then the government also can also come in. I think a lot of things can turn around. Recently, a 500 level university student, Osariame NJ Asen from Edo State, proved that some Nigerians love to read by setting the Guinness World Record for the longest marathon reading aloud by an individual. The white man popular saying is that if you want to hide any man from anything from black man, you hide it in a book. So it's a form of a culture we have now that even education does not matter. People have to tell you that education is a scam. You can see that even the government himself has failed to bring out the importance of education to Nigeria. So I want to say in a nutshell that if the government wants to reactivate the reading culture in this country, it must start from the primary level. Reviving Nigeria's reading culture is believed to be crucial for intellectual development, critical thinking, and fostering a knowledge-driven society. Set OPI4, reporting for BTV News. In a bid to give underprivileged youths and orphans in Edo states an edge in the tech-dominated world, an initiative theme, the Orphan Hub, using National Youth Service Corps Community Development Service as its platform, has emerged. The convener, Corps member Emmanuel Nameka Vitus, stated that the initiative is to train participants in tech skills, such as photography, digital marketing, social media management, among others. BTV News Faithful Okwokam tells us more. Several participants gathered at the Edo State Innovative Hub, which was the venue for a three weeks training in digital skills. The variety of skills to be taught within this period include social media management, freelancing, digital marketing, video editing, photography, videography, and many more. The convener of this initiative, Mr. Emmanuel Inemeka, stated in an interview that the initiative was born from the burden to give less privileged and often an opportunity to learn and explore the tech world instead of engaging in vices while also sharing his experience with a friend who lost his parents at an early age and began treading an evil path. For this idea came to me last two years ago while I was in, in, in the university. You know, I could really vividly remember of, of one of my, my childhood friends he, he, he is an orphan. We are still together now. He is an orphan. And I tell you that this guy, that the parent died when he was very young. He is a Benin person. He is from Edo State, you know, from this place. So I remember the parent died at a very tender age. And this guy has been going through a lot of things, a lot of uh, trauma and so many things, you know, by so doing, this guy is now, is now, you know, because of he doesn't have anyone to, to support him, to, you know, to help him with whatever he was doing. You know, he didn't have anyone. So he is now following bad, bad people. I, didn't, I don't want other children to suffer the same fate than my friend. Because if my friend has had, have had a kind of opportunity like this, he won't have, he won't be running inside the street without nothing. Speaking with a volunteer from the training team, Copa Emmanuel Bright said the training is aimed at giving the participants a chance to become better persons in the society. So we are here to support and giving the much more effort he needed from us as a team. We are working together. Our aim is to make sure because the world is going globally. And having this privilege is a privilege that has been brought to the orphan homes enough to make their life to be to what or to amount to something that will profit the society. Some beneficiaries of the initiative expressed their expectations for the training and also thanked the convener and partners, showering prayers on them. I'm really, really excited. It's not, it's not every day that I see this opportunity. You can't, you can't find it anywhere, actually. So it's actually like an opportunity to come knocking at my door. So I'm really happy. So I'm expecting to learn more about computer 
to know how to do all those things like photography, videography, graphic designing, and all of that. And I'm happy, and I want to say a big thank you to everyone that is doing this thing. I want to say may God continue to bless you in Jesus' name. So I'm happy for the program, and I'm expecting new things because what we want to do here, I don't know anything about it, so I can't say much. But I'm expecting to learn new things. A very big thank you. And without God, you can't do anything. So the Lord will continue to strengthen them. More participants are expected to benefit from it as the organizers of the program intend to give out laptops by the end of the training. Faithful Opocam, reporting for BTV News. Nigeria, a major producer and consumer of yam, has experienced a significant hike in the price of yam in recent times. This increase can be attributed to the rise of fuel prices across the country, impacting various aspects of the economy, including transportation and agricultural production. BTV News crew visited a yam market in Forestry Junction along Dalson Road, Benin City, to carry out a market survey on the current market price of yam. The report. Traders at the Yam Market along Dancing Road, Bini City, complain bitterly at the continual surge in the price of yam and the adverse effects it is having on patronage. They stated that the increment in transportation fare is the major cause of the price increment, while calling on government's intervention in order to cushion the effect of the hardship. One of the traders said that the price of yam has doubled within one year. According to her, a piece of yam that was sold at 700 naira last year is currently selling for 1,500 naira. Adding that Nigerians are are groaning because of the hardship. If you reduce the uh, diesel, then this motor now two point something. Now we they take the carry on. and the produce where we they cut, cut for road will book for a uh, Benway two fifty. You take two fifty, uh, two eighty. You will take two three hundred cut paper each uh, state rich year. Lost two million something. It will be three point something. That's why this load not they let us say now. Nah. It's too hard. And this time, now, now planted time, that's why yam still the dear, motor the dear. You know, they let us say now. The price of yam now is different of uh, last year. This year, we used to say last year, 70,400. It's now 130. The vehicle we used to carry last year, the vehicle we used to carry it, 800,000. But now it's 1.5, uh, 2.5 for vehicle, only vehicle, not the expenses. Because the people com uh, complain of diesel. That is why the, the motor increase. This time last year, yeah, why would they buy 100, why would they sell 100,000? Now would they sell them 40 something thousand? This time last year, in April, we just entered today. So as we tell the buyer for that side, we for, see, see buyer low. Then if we will come here, we will come to sell alone. But this year now, yeah, what would they sell for the something, 100 and something for year? What do you mean, mean the express it costs and not the gas? Because the drive, the, this trailer, where you do see so, they carry us before. Last year, we they carry at 1.5. But this year now, we they come carry at 1.2. Expenses never the inside. What we go do for road and the inside markets and the loading and everything. One of the consumers cried out, saying that she is finding it difficult to cope with the inflation being experienced in the country. Others said that the recent appreciation in the value of Naira had not reflected on the price of yam. They pleaded with the government to urgently step in by coming with a lasting solution to the skyrocketing price of items. Alleged where we get plenty. Where, where? The yam where we supposed to buy, like uh, 6,000. Eh? Now, now 12,000. 15,000. The one where we're supposed to buy like uh, 8,000 before. Oh, don't hide where, where. We don't know where we they go. We don't know where they, where they come from for this country. Traders and customers believe that the government can formulate policies to mitigate the effect of the hike in fuel price on food prices. Set OPI4 reporting for BTV News. 
Work resumed today in many government offices and banks in Benin City after the Easter break, which began on Friday last week. Some citizens who are workers expressed their joy to resume activities in their various workplaces as the Easter holiday afford them the opportunity to unwind and spend time with family and friends. BTV News correspondent was at the city centre and breaks details of the story. Though this is not the first working day of the week, it was observed that many government offices, departments, including banks, were agog with activities as work has resumed after the Easter holiday, which started on Friday last week and ended on Easter Monday. Some working class citizens who spoke with BTV News correspondents said that the Easter holiday enabled them to catch their breath and to spend time with their families, visiting recreational centers for fun. They added that they were glad to be back at their workplaces, though the situation in the country currently is stressful not quite easy. However, some respondents expressed optimism that the federal government should be given time to salvage the economy as things will get better gradually. Although during the holiday it was not quite it was quite short anyway. We actually have a good time with our loved ones and our families. Of course we went to some tourist centers we were actually relaxed and feel at home. Although it was nice and bound to work and you know the economic situation of the country right now at least we still thank God, have given us uh, just uh, two days to rest. We thank God and now we are back to work and, and of course we are equally, you know, we are fit and we are ready to move on with our work. The only because it makes some of us to go and see our loved ones. Yeah. Uh -huh. But resuming work today, every, it's like, especially in the bank, banking sector, everywhere, Jampa, I went to the bank, ah, man, <laughs> it, was, it was here. So, but I thank God for everything. Through this period that we, we enjoyed this uh, period, uh, Easter holiday, you see that uh, that is the only time we really have, have to, sit in our, in, to sit at home to enjoy it in our family. I think that is the, the summary of everything. Strenuous time for us as Nigerians, you know, uh, but nevertheless, we have to celebrate. Yes, we have to celebrate, and after celebration, work has to start. Well, I came back to work, good and sad news all over, but we give God the glory. It's fine, and uh, everything is going on, struggle continues, until the day one gets it to his own self and uh, things start working better. And I think uh, if we want to talk about the government, let's give them time. I'm not specific about uh, those states, but I'm specific about the country. Yes, uh, I'm not a politician, but I believe everybody should be given time to actually express what they have. And you know, when you want to do things and there are um, uh, sacrifices around you, there's tendency for things not to work out, even when you are putting efforts. So I would just encourage Nigerians to just give the president time. As work resumes nationwide in the second day of April, Nigerian workers hold their heads high as the struggle continues in the work environment. Olu Atoyin, Weedola, reporting for BTV News. Every year all over the world, the World Press Freedom Day is usually celebrated on the 3rd of May. To a large extent, many countries have witnessed the removal of complete government censorship and control of press activities. There are, however, however still several limitations enforced in form of policies and laws. Nigerians commented on the concept of press freedom and the degree of its practicability. BTV News faithful Okwokam completes the story. On December 2, 1766, the Swedish Parliament passed legislation that is now recognized as the world's first law supporting the freedom of the press and freedom of information. The Nigerian constitution has provisions for press freedom. To what extent is this being practiced? Speaking to several respondents on the concept of press freedom in Nigeria, they all commented that the press have much freedom in relaying information, which is their primary responsibility and is of much relevance to the entire populace, especially the weak ones. We can tell you as of certain that I don't think that uh, the press has no freedom in Nigeria. They do. But how they express that freedom is another thing we do not understand. Because if you go to some other countries where press is really suppressed, you cannot even stand where you are standing now to say you want to practice journalism. So I believe that it is the quality of what you write or what you, your research is in all the events that happen within the economy 
that matters. Now, you know, the, the press in Nigeria and the social media, they are the voice of the voiceless. There are so many things that we cannot see. There are so many things that is happening within the society that we cannot even hear or see. But with the help of this uh, press, who can hear them, who can see them, there are some things that is happening around the society. If not for press, I think by now, so many people would have been deformed of so many information. So we encourage them to do more, and we also encourage them to give the right news, not changing what happened. They should give the right news at the appropriate time. So the media has the right to express their view in a nation, in a do state, in any community and land. But the media has a fundamental human right to express their opinion. Other respondents, on the other hand, believe that the activities of the press are being regulated and restricted, also mentioning that some stories were influenced and make believe. Yes, it, uh, it is no longer a news that sometimes press are being denied of their rights when they are when they obey some when they obey some areas of events to want to hear from the masses over what they have to say on their depression or what is happening in that circle that the press of it. So I think uh, it is very good that uh, the press should be given the privilege to do their job at all circle and at all area. All those things are not practicable now. Network news, my father has been hearing network news before he died. And everything they used to see in network news, you don't see it on ground. It's just story. I'm telling you. Other persons believe that the press freedom allows the hard cry of citizens reach the ears of the persons in government. For their self, they are working to know how people feeling they are feeling, how they are living, how course of life. So they have to interview people and know so that they can, they, the government will know what people they are passing through. Because they cannot reach everywhere. It's only the press, as you are here now, you are meeting out to people, but the president cannot reach this place at this present time. By the help of the press, they can get to this place. By you pro, uh, publishing what we, what we are passing through in this environment. Citizens are entitled to basic fundamental human rights. The activities of the press as the watchdog of the government help to ensure the protection of these rights. Faith Folk Bokam reports in for BTV News. Now let's quickly move to the global scene with Rebecca Guffey. Following an Israeli airstrike that killed seven World Central Kishin WCK workers, the charity is suspending its operations in Gaza. The workers were part of an aid convoy leaving a warehouse in central Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu acknowledged the incident, stating it was unintentional. WCK, a major aid provider to Gaza, is assessing its future actions. The strike occurred as the convoy, which had unloaded over 100 tons of aid, was leaving. All three convoy vehicles, including armored ones, were hit. The workers wore WCK logo bullet proof vest, Netanyahu expressed regret and assured a thorough review by the IDF. Iran pledges retaliation following an alleged Israeli strike that destroyed an Iranian consulate in Syria's capital, Damascus. Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and President Ibrahim Raisi condemned the attack, promising a response. Reports indicate casualties, including seven revolutionary guards and six Syrians. Israeli military refrains from commenting on foreign media reports but hint at targeting individuals linked to attacks on Israeli and American assets. Israel has conducted numerous strikes in, in Syria, targeting Iranian-linked groups, including revolutionary guards. Tensions rise as Iran warns of escalating confrontations with Israel following the attack. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has paid a $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud case, preventing the state from seizing its assets. 
in February, Trump was found guilty of inflating property values in order to pay a $464 million penalty. By posting bond, Trump can delay paying the penalty until his appeals are heard. Trump denies any wrongdoing and believes the case is politically motivated. Initially, he was asked to post the full penalty amount, but it was reduced to $175 million last week. If his appeal is unsuccessful, Trump will have to pay the full $464 million or risk losing his properties. For now, his assets, including Trump Tower and Mar-a-Lago, are safe. Trump's lawyer stated he is looking forward to appealing the, the verdict. He secured the bond through Knight Insurance Group, but the details of collateral are not disclosed. Finally, a child died and two others were badly hurt in a shooting at Vietola School in Vanta, Finland. All victims and suspects were 12 years old. The incident happened in a classroom shortly after school started. Police arrived quickly and provided aid, but one child died at the scene. The suspect fled, but was later caught in Helsinki. He had a gun, admitted to the shooting, and is now under investigation. Since he is under 15, he is not held in custody, but is under social services care. And that's it on the global news segment for tonight. Thanks very much for watching. I am Rebecca Goffey. And now to sports, Bayana Bayana of South Africa goalkeeper Kaylin Swartz sees starting the last round of the Olympics qualifiers away against Nigeria as an advantage, viewing the likely hostile atmosphere as motivation to secure qualifications for the Olympics. Let's join BTV News Minister Agagba for details of this and more stories from the world of sports. The team faces the Super Falcons on Friday in Abuja, followed by a return leg at Loftus Versfit Stadium four days later. With Andili Daomini sidelined due to medical reasons, Swart is set to start against Nigeria, having alternated with the other keeper in recent matches. Swart believes playing away first reduces pressure, citing their previous qualifiers against Congo and Tanzania, where they scored crucial away goals and returned home with confidence, despite anticipating challenges from Nigerian passionate fans, SWAT sees it as an opportunity for the team to thrive under pressure, drawing on their experience of winning against host Morocco in the Women's African Cup of Nations finals, despite facing a hostile crowd at the Sold Out Stadium in Rabat. Manchester United and former French international defender Raphael Varane spoke on the need for improved concussion care in football following several concerning incidents in his career. Reflecting on pivotal matches, he highlighted instances where he played despite suffering concussions days earlier, including during France's 2014 World Cup quarterfinal defeat to Germany and the 2020 Champions League match against Manchester United while at Real Madrid. Recalling a specific incident against Nigeria, Varane described taking a ball to the side of his head and continuing to play in a sort of autopilot mode, raising questions about his fitness for subsequent matches. Despite feeling weakened, Varen performed well in these games, but he acknowledged the uncertainty surrounding the potential consequences of further head trauma. Varen stressed the importance of addressing dangers associated with repeated concussions, including the risk of second impact syndrome, which occurs when the brain swells rapidly after a second concussion before symptoms from an earlier one have fully resolved. He advocated for reducing in heading during training sessions to mitigate this risk. Liberty Media, the owners of Formula One, has sealed a deal to acquire MotoGP for approximately $4.5 billion. The agreement involves purchasing the 86% stake from Dorna, the current owners based in Spain, with the transaction expected to finalize by the close of 2024, subject to regulatory clearances. This move expands Liberty Media's foothold in the motorsports as they already hold ownership in Formula One, cementing their position as major players in both four-wheel and two-wheel racing disciplines. In the competitive bidding process, Liberty Media had matched other interested parties in quarter sport investment, QSI, and TKO Group Holdings to secure acquisition of MotoGP. With this acquisition, Liberty Media underscores the commitment to the global motorsport landscape, aiming to capitalize on the immense popularity and commercial potential of MotoGP alongside their existing ventures in Formula One. And that's it on Sport News tonight. Millicent Agagba reporting for BTV News. Shifting gears to business, on Monday, the Nigerian Naira witnessed an appreciation to 1,250 Naira per dollar at the parallel segment of the foreign exchange market. This represents a 0.43% increase from the rates of 1,280 Naira 
recorded on March 29. BTV News gifts Uagboy has details of this and more from the business desk. In the official section of the FX market, the Naira expressed a depreciation of 0.69% to 1,309.39 Naira per dollar on March 28, down from 1,300.43 Naira per dollar on March 27. Currency traders commonly referred to as the change BDC's operators quoted the buying rate of the dollar at 1,213 Naira per dollar and selling at the price of 1,200 at 15 naira per dollar, indicating a profit margin of 20 naira. Aminu Gwadebe, the president of the Association of Buridi Change Operators of Nigeria, highlighted on March 31st that the reintroduction of BDCs into the FS market has brought about stability in the exchange rates. He mentioned that this move has eliminated illegal economic activities such as hoarding, rent seeking, and round tripping, leading to exchange rate convergence. Gwadebe further emphasized that the increase in FX in flows through the Central Bank of Nigeria's CBN's monetary instrument has bolstered foreign reserves, enabling the Apex Bank to effectively defend the local currency. The Nigerian bottling company NBC has announced an increase in the prices of its products from Saturday, April 6, 2024, amid the high cost of doing business in the country. A circular sent to its distributors in, Lag in Lagos region and signed by its sales director for Greater Lagos, Mr. Samuel Oluwatoye, said action was taken due to the current economic reality and operational costs driven by currency devaluation and raw material prices increases, coupled with our aim to remain competitive. He said, that the upward price adjustment affects each soft drink packaged in returnable glass bottles and not those in PET bottles. Zenith Bank PLC has emerged as the best bank in Nigeria in the Global Finance Best Banks Award 2024, winning the award for the fourth time since 2019. The bank was among other banks from the 36 countries in Africa recognized as the prestigious Global Finance announced its 31st annual Best Bank Award winners. The editor of the Global Finance made the selection after extensive consultations with corporate financial executives, bankers, and banking consultants and analysts worldwide. Commenting on the award, the outgoing group managing director, chief executive of Zenith Bank, Dr. Ebenezer Oyego, said the award serves as a powerful affirmation of resilience and tenacity despite handwits and very challenging macroeconomic environment. He expressed profound gratitude to the founder and chairman, Jib Ovia CFRO, for his exceptional vision and foundational role in establishing a resilient and enduring financial institution. And that's it on business news tonight gifts who reporting for btv news with that we've come to the end of our news package for tonight it's always a pleasure to have you on board with us my name is olua toy oyedola have a good night